uh, thank you for coming from all over the world. Somebody is up at midnight in the United Kingdom. Thank you for that. And all over the country. Um, we love co-hosting these. And so I'm going to introduce the executive director of the Natural Areas Conservancy, Sarah Charlotte Powers, to uh, introduce her organization. And here she comes. There Great. she is. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Joshua and Lori and Leslie from the Cary Institute and my colleague Tessa O'Connell, and of course, Tony Hiss for making this evening possible. Um, my name is Sarah Charlotte Powers. I'm a co-founder and executive director of the Natural Areas Conservancy. We are a New York City-based nonprofit organization it was founded 10 years ago with the goal of improving the care of the 20,000 acres of natural habitat that exist within New York City. We approach our work through a combination of primary scientific research, field-based restoration, workforce development, and improving public access. And since 2019, we have also convened a 19, excuse me, a 17 city national network with um, peers from all across the nation conducting research about the value of urban natural areas across the country and advocating for resources to improve and advance their care. I'm really excited for tonight's conversation, and I will um, start by introducing tonight's author, Tony Hiss. Tony Hiss is the author of 15 books, including Rescuing the Planet, Protecting Half the Earth, the Land to Heal the Earth, sorry, Protecting Half the Land to Heal the Earth, which has been hailed as a keystone resource. Other books include the award-winning Experience of Place, and H2O, Highlands to Ocean, about the vast natural landscape that still supports our incredibly crowded New York City area. Tony was a staff writer at the New Yorker magazine for more than 30 years and a visiting scholar at New York University for 25 years. He has lectured around the world and is a consultant on planning and conservation issues. The National Recreation and Parks Association National Literary Award praised him for a lifetime of spellbinding and poignant writing about how our environments, modes of travel, and other aspects of the American landscape affect our lives. Tony lives in New York City, where he's dialing in from today with his wife, writer Lois Metzger. Tony, we're really thrilled to be with you this evening. Thank you for joining us. Well, it's a great pleasure and honor for me to be here with two distinguished and amazing conservationists and ecologists, Josh and Sarah. So thank you guys. Well, it's our pleasure, Tony. And, and why don't we just jump right in? I have to remember not to talk loudly because then you won't hear me. You know, the Biden administration has proposed a conservation plan, which they call 30 by 30, 30% 30 of the area of the United States protected by 2030. But that's really just the beginning. The late Ed Wilson, who wrote the foreword to your book, Renewing the, Rescuing the Planet, wrote a book earlier called Half Earth, and that was in 2016. And in the book, he credits you with inventing the term Half Earth in a Smithsonian article before that. So can you begin just by explaining what the Half, half Earth concept is, uh, the science behind it, and why it's so important? Sure. Um, thanks. Um, I think when Ed Wilson first began talking in these enormous terms, he was thinking he was challenging people. Uh, <laughs> in the business world, there's something called a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal, uh, which you set. You, it has to be something that's not too huge because otherwise it'll never get accomplished. And it has to be something that's not too easy to do because then why bother thinking about it? The space program that put a man on the moon is considered a quintessential BHAG. But it wasn't just a challenge. We now realize that 50% is what we need, is what all the other species need uh, in order to survive. And we need them to survive because it's patterns of living creatures uh, that keep the air breathable, keep the water drinkable, and, and sequester carbon. Um, so that's the 50% goal is sort of based on a 
huge range of field work. The some creatures need habitat, at least 75% of their original habitat to survive. Others maybe only 25, so it splits the difference. Um, but it also uh, is a way of talking about the whole conservation movement because we've now, as you say, protected about 15% of the earth. And it's taken us 150 years to do that. Yellowstone National Park, the very first national park anywhere was proclaimed in 1872. Um, and now there are something like 6,000 national parks around the world. But it also began shortly thereafter a different strand. Uh, in addition to creating these wonderful standalone parks, there were people who began to think at a different scale. Mm -hmm. Most notably, Benton Mackay, who's remembered as the father of the Appalachian Trail. When he was, the summer he graduated from college, he bushwhacked his way up a mountain in Vermont, shinned up to the top of the tallest tree, swaying there. He had this sudden sense that he was in a single place that stretched from Maine all the way down to Georgia uh, along the length of the Appalachian Mountains. And that became his uh, life work to not only build a trail, which was later built mostly by volunteers on their weekends, it's sort of the largest piece of, uh, of uh, infrastructure anywhere that's built by volunteers. But he was it more interested in the larger landscape around the trail, what he called the, the realm. Um, so he was sort of the first began thinking bigger, and now we're being called on to think bigger in a big way. 30 by 30 would mean jumping from 15% conserved to 30% conserved in this decade. And it took us 150 years to get to 15%. So this is a clarion call. Uh, others are talking about 50 by 50. Some are even talking about 50 by 30. There's multiple goals going around. And uh, Wilson bequeathed to us at the Half Earth Foundation, which is working on these issues. And there's another group called Nature Needs Half. Um, and then what's most exciting is there are people working on every scale. And that's what's so exciting about this evening because we've got New York working hard on national areas with Sarah's group. And we've got a little just beyond the urban fringe, wonderful work being done by the Cary Institute up, up the Hudson Valley. So these, I see these as the twin magnetic poles in the New York area. And I'm so glad they're coming together to well, co host this evening. Thank you, and, and it's a very, very, um, it's a great goal, but it's also a very fragile planet we live on, isn't it? Very fragile. And and what is it, the, the, the biosphere and the atmosphere are, are, we've got a beautiful picture up there that sort of describes it. This is a picture of the thinness, as I like to call it. Uh, a genius Russian, Biogeochemist named Vladimir Yovanovitch Vernadsky wrote the first treatise on the biosphere back in 1926. Biosfera. Interestingly enough, he's equally revered in Russia and Ukraine. Um, <laughs> both claim him as someone, for them, uh, another Einstein, another Darwin. And he pointed out that the biosphere is incredibly old. We know it's almost as old as the Earth. Living things came along pretty quickly. We know it's huge, seen side, seen side to side, because it stretches all the way around the globe. But it's, of course, not really a sphere. It's a coating on a sphere. Yeah. Um, and most creatures live between the top of Mount Everest and the bottom of the Mariana Trench in the Pacific Ocean. And that's a distance of 12 and a half miles, which, as a British physicist pointed out, if it was laid flat, you could easily drive across it in 20 minutes or less. So we've got this built-in vulnerability. We've got ancientness, we've got abundance, we've got hugeness, but we've also got this third dimension or almost this lack of a third dimension, this thinness. And, and that's got to now become one of the things we keep in our heads as we think about how things are changing. Right, and it's so, the, sub, the subtext for climate change. And it's not just thinness, the biosphere is the strangest shape of anything we've ever encountered. And we're right in the middle of it. And it 
goes below us, it penetrates into the ground. It goes above us, it hovers up in the air. Uh, so in addition to the thinness, there's this withinness that we're just beginning to get used to. Yeah. So we were going to talk a bit about North America more generally, not just the New York area. And in your book, you you make a really powerful argument for the importance of First Nation and Indigenous lands, particularly in the boreal forests of Canada, um, and to that to achieve 50% by 2050 in North America. The boreal is a critical part of that. So I was wondering if you could talk about how, how and why Indigenous lands are so important and why the boreal is so important. The boreal is something that us Southerners, which we all are compared to the boreal forest, uh, can hardly believe still exists. This is, it's 85% intact. It's absolutely enormous. As, as you can see, it stretches from Alaska all the way to the Atlantic Ocean. And it's about a thousand miles from top to bottom. This is as pristine a landscape as the one that Marquette and Joliet encountered in 1673 when they canoed down the Mississippi, or that Lewis and Clark encountered in 1805 when they made their celebrated trip to the West Coast. Uh, it's overwhelming. You can, it's um, got 300 species, it's got unchanged abundance, it's got, it's the North America bird nursery, three billion birds fly up there every year to nest and three to five billion birds fly south every fall. The Great Lakes, we think of the Great Lakes as ending in Lake Huron, but really that's just the beginning of a huge chain of lakes that extends all the way through the boreal, all the way up to the to Great Bear Lake at the very top, which is as big as Ontario or Erie. Uh, it's so big, it makes its own weather. Uh, it's so, the water is so crystal clear that you look and think you see logs on the bottom. 60 feet down, but they're not logs, they're a giant uh, lake trout, uh, which still exists there in, in absolutely enormous size, 60 to 70 pounds and lived to be 60, 70 years old. Um, this is a landscape uh, that is so precious and the Canadians behaved badly, of course, to their indigenous people called First Nations up there. But they, what they didn't do, which what, what, what we did do, is kick them off the land. They didn't kick them off the land, except oddly enough, just as we did when they established actual national parks. So there are 600 indigenous communities in this enormous landscape. Um, and by the way, the second largest river in North America, the Mackenzie River, flows through the boreal forest. And it's two and a half miles wide in some places. It's 2,600 miles long. And I never heard of it until I got up there. And even more confusingly, it flows north. We think rivers are supposed to flow south down into the Gulf, but it flows north up into the Arctic Ocean. Uh, so the Canadian government is now turning to its indigenous communities and saying, we want you to set up a whole second system of national parks. You will be the rangers. You will be the moccasins and mucklucks on the ground. And parks that make Yellowstone look puny are coming into being. Some of them 10, 20 million acres. Yellowstone is 2 million acres. Um, up in, uh, where is it? In uh, Northwest Territories, which is where I got to go. There's 12 million acres have been set aside with six and a half million more under consideration in the Yukon. 25 million acres are being put into indigenous protected areas. In the Eastern Arctic Ocean, there's now a 27 million acre uh, national marine preserve. In the Hudson Lowlands, where all the peatlands are, there's another 12 million acres. It's just astonishing. Uh, the place is hard to fathom, and what's happening to it in terms of protection is hard to fathom. Uh, we've, we were all brought up to that the frontier disappeared 100 years ago, but that's only if you just go west. If you turn north, it's still there. 
Tony, that's a great segue into the next topic I wanted to ask you about. So when many of us think about biodiversity, we picture big national parks like Yellowstone and the Yukon and the Boreal Forest. But you also write in your book about diversity hotspots, these interconnected places, including the North American Coastal Plain hotspot, which runs from Mexico up through Florida and then up along the East Coast, including... Um, Brooklyn and Queens, which is a familiar habitat to a lot of our listeners, uh, wanted to just hear you talk a little bit more about some of the diversity and specifically diversity hotspots that are found closer to home. Sure. Thanks, Sarah. Um, there are sort of three R's. The three R's of uh, half earth are retain stuff that is still wild, places that are still wild, restore those places which were once wilder and reconnect those that have been severed, uh, links severed. Now there's a lot going on in this one picture because the whole hotspot movement began with Norman Myers back in 1988, a man who liked to say he, it was easiest for him to think sideways. Um, if Benton Mackay had what he called a planetary feeling, um, Norman had a sideways feeling. And he pointed out that within places that are biologically rich, there are some that are even biologically richer. And in fact, on 2.3% of the land, um, something like more than half the plants are concentrated and something like 43% of birds and mammals and reptiles and amphibians. So originally there were 10 hotspots around the world. Now there are 36. This is the 36th green one you see there, the North American coastal plain. By definition, a hotspot has to be a place that has already lost about 70% of its habitat and has to have at least 1,500 different kinds of plants that are uh, unique to its area. Well, uh, the North American coastal plain hotspot, which is only a few years old now, 86% has, has disturbed habitat. And look what it has to contend with. Houston, Tampa, Miami, Washington, Baltimore, Philly, Brooklyn and Queens, and New Haven is just beyond its borders. So it's something that we just have to begin to get our minds around. Now, the, the circles on the map show all the cities that the national the Natural Areas Coalition has gathered in this coalition uh, of urban metro forests. And amazingly, when you amalgamate their natural lands of these 17 cities, something like 1.7 million acres of natural lands exist within these metropolitan areas, uh, which is close to the size of Yellowstone. However, there's another force to contend with that you can't quite see in this map. And that's the idea that in addition, there are 13 what are called mega regions of cities coming into being. Seattle's part of something called Cascadia. Uh, Houston, uh, Flor all of Florida is a single area. Atlanta's part of another one. Something called the Great Lakes area takes in Minneapolis, St. Paul, Chicago, Indianapolis, St. Louis, Louisville. And then there's the Boston, Washington corridor, the original megalopolis, which has got Washington, Baltimore, Philly, New York all the way up to Boston. So there's so much going on simultaneously that a group like National Natural Areas Conservancy is grappling with, and God bless them, because there never was a, an, a group in New York or anywhere else before that whose uh, purview was natural areas. We've had friends of parks, but not friends of urban natural areas. So this is not only a, a astonishingly needed, but astonishingly successful in terms, after 10 years, all the work they've done in managing natural areas. So can't say enough about them. And you know, it's, it's amazing. We have coyotes in Central Park. Carnivores have really uh, found urban areas and learned to live with us, but there are a lot of carnivores that need huge areas and new technologies are really doing such a great job of, of helping us understand uh, the spatial needs of some of these animals. 
And, you know, when we were talking the other day, uh, I mentioned that in your book, you talk about a particular wolf in Yellowstone named Pluey, who sort of gives a mind boggling uh, wander around the Yellowstone ecosystem and beyond. And I was wondering if you could sort of put Pluey's wanderings in the context of of what space we need uh, and why that 50 percent is so important. Sure. But I will just say, since you're talking about coyotes in Central Park, there were beavers had returned to the Bronx River a couple of years ago. And one was, of course, called Justin Beaver. Um, Pluey was a five-year-old wolf who was uh, collared in June of 1991 in the midst of a drenching rainstorm near Banff National Park in Canada. So that's hence the name Pluey, French for rain. Uh, the expectation was they knew wolves, wolves wandered around a bit. The expectation was she might move 50, 60 miles or so. Um, this, and for six months or so, she did do that. This was one of the first animals with a new generation of uh, sensing collars, one that could, the pinging signal could bounce up to a satellite and be read back on the earth. Before that, you had to stay in radio range of any collared animal. And it was a lot of work to chase after animals and keep up with them because they weren't on the roads the way uh, the biologists with the apparatus to receive the signals were. So, okay, in November, her signal went off the air, disappeared. They thought, okay, it happens. Maybe the collar fell off. Um, we got some useful data. A month later, uh, I got a call from someone in NASA saying, uh, we got your wolf signal down here. We're in Montana. She had wandered all the way down to Montana uh, near Glacier National Park. And for the next 18 months, uh, she continued on this extraordinary loop around uh, all these different states and provinces of Canada until she finally went off the air again. Something like not only 100,000 square kilometers, but this showed the enormous range uh, that a carnivore, a, a top of the food chain carnivore will traverse in the course of a lifetime. So we were obviously not thinking at the right scale uh, in terms of what is needed. But we finally had the apparatus that allowed us to listen to what the animals wanted to tell us about who they were and what they were up to. Now, since then, that's been refined wonderfully. And there's now something called Icarus up on the International Space Station, the brainchild of a brilliant uh, German biologist named Martin Bukowski, uh, which can receive and transmit up to 15 million signals from birds, mammals, et cetera, simultaneously in bursts. So we begin to follow the whole natural world in, in its motions. And Pekelski calls Icarus humanity's seeing eye dog because now we can take advantage of the senses that animals have that we're too uh, unequipped to, to follow, the, their amazing eyesight, their amazing hearing. Uh, all the other senses that they have. So it's a whole new age and it's just in time because suddenly we need to think about saving and protecting this land and these habitats before they go away. And sometimes they, again, we get astounded all the time. 10 years ago, the same thing happened to a guy who was tracking mule deer in the West. Uh, it, they thought, oh, they move a few move around a little bit. He, uh, again, collared a mule deer. It, the signal went dead. He thought, okay, lost another mule deer. Well, turned out they would, mule deer would travel something like 80 to 100 miles twice a year to go from wintering range to summering range. Same is true for pronghorn antelopes and all kinds of other ungulates out west. So all of this information is flooding into us just at the moment when we can take advantage of it and have to take advantage of it. 
Um, <clears throat> I'm going to go from the wide ranging large carnivores back to New York City and um, have shared that there's 20,000 acres of natural areas in within the city boundaries. It's a little bit hard sometimes for people to really picture what we mean when we describe these places, but we're talking about large wetland and woodland areas interspersed within our city park system and national park system. And we know that urban natural areas, both within New York City and across the country have a real power in terms of the benefits that they can offer in social connectivity, access to nature, but also benefits in the face of climate change, like flood mitigation and cooling. Um, just this past summer, the Natural Areas Conservancy conducted research looking at the cooling benefits of our natural area forests within the urban context. We, we know that extreme heat is deadly for urban residents, and we know that street trees offer a real benefit in cooling residential neighborhoods, but we're learning that our natural areas are an additional five degrees cooler even than our shaded streetscapes, and we're really um, interested in thinking about and hearing your thoughts, Tony, on how urban nature fits within this broader construct and movement of half-Earth. Well, one of the things I like about what you guys are up to is that you also, in addition to realizing that these natural areas, 10 or 11% of the city uh, are still there, uh, that they need help too. If we just let them alone, they're probably going to decline. They need management and care uh, and attention. Um, street trees, um, as you say, are another breed, but as tree canopy extends across the city, I think people begin to feel more connected to the natural areas too. And I think one of the things you're doing that's so exciting is to tell people that the natural areas are just as much a part of their heritage as museums or libraries or Broadway theaters. And they need the same kind of care. And they also need to be made accessible to everyone. Um, so street trees are sort of a calling card in some ways to the natural areas. And they do, uh, uh, they do begin to degrim the city. The city, what we're up against in New York is uh, first during the Revolutionary War, the, the British occupiers chopped down all the trees to, uh, to burn in their in their fireplaces. Um, so most of the natural areas are a couple of hundred years old. Um, then came along the commissioner's plan in 18, uh, early 19th century, which chopped up Manhattan into a grid of, a, of avenues and cross streets that meet at right angles, completely oblivious of the natural landscape. They chopped down the hills, they threw them into the streams, which the Brit Dutch had called the kills, and made landfill literally a, a level playing field for development, and set aside only a very few spaces uh, for greenery, assuming uh, totally inaccurately that people would get all their uh, recreational benefits along the water's edge, which of course then industrialized. So uh, that's the backdrop. And this is a completely upside down way of looking at it and helping people to think that the, nat that the natural conditions are in fact the underlying reality of the city, no matter how built up it gets. Need to unmute to ask you a question, Tony. Sorry about that. Um, we've talked a lot, you know, I think one of the lovely things about your book and about the way your brain works is you fluidly go from a small scale to a large scale and can accordion in and out. And, you know, an important part of the coastal plain that you showed as, as the latest hotspot is Florida. Yes. And, and you know, I, I love the conservation story behind Reed Noss's PhD with Larry Harris, where Reed actually put on a map 
what a connected landscape in Florida would look like. And that was, I think, in the sort of mid-late 80s. And would you talk to us about two different things, one of which is the way in which this kind of vision can provoke and promote conservation, but also about what the limits are to this kind of work in restoration, both in urban and in, in rural uh, communities. And maybe use, as you do in your book, uh, the latter part of your book, the experience of M.C. Davis and, the, and, and Piney Woods as a way of, of talking about these things as a specific within the general uh, case of the Florida plan. Yes, thanks, uh, Josh. There are two oh, wonderful long stories. Question. <laughs> there are two wonderful stories here. Reed Noss is one of the undersung heroes of conservation biology. Back in the 30s, uh, a brilliant uh, ecologist named Victor Shelford had uh, posited the idea of preserving natural areas all over the continent. And he saw them as core areas surrounded by a slightly uh, more porous use with more people in it called buffer zones. Reed Noss's insight was that you didn't, that the buffer zones could be detached from just circling a natural area and could be extended like snakes and corridors across the landscape to the next core area, thereby making an even larger area. And the thing he came up with in Florida was uh, how, the, how this could be done, connecting protected areas by extending buffers and corridors. This, this Florida wildlife corridor has actually now been formally adopted by the state of Florida. Uh, amazingly enough, through a unanimous vote of its legislature, at, with the signature of Ron DeSantis, uh, who's heavily in favor of this. And as a result of this, something like a third of the state of Florida is currently protected. Again, they hope to get up to closer to 50%, uh, which would really seal the deal. But Florida, as we know, is a place that gets a thousand new residents a day. There's, this is a big pressure point pushing back against the possibility. So MC Davis uh, is one of the heroes of the people who stake a claim for the landscape. MC Davis liked to call himself uh, a dirt road panhandle boy. Uh, he was, grew up hard scrabble, made his first stake play in poker, became a multimillionaire commodities broker, um, thought nothing of the landscape, was caught in a traffic jam one day on I-4, fuming, uh, saw a sign on a high school billboard that said, Black Bear Seminar. He thought anything's better than this. He peeled off, turned up, he said, tiny audience. There was a drunk in one corner, a couple of Canadian tourists looking for day old donuts, uh, a local politician who realized he wasn't gonna get any votes. And up on the dais were two women talking about Florida black bear, an endangered subspecies of the black bear, and how they could, couldn't exist, continue to exist, because their habitat was being taken away, and their habitat was this amazing forest called longleaf pine, uh, which had been uh, covered 90 million acres, uh, and was down to only 3% of its uh, original state. Uh, and it is amazing for us because uh, it feels like walking through a park. The, the limbs of the trees are way overhead and they're just little, uh, almost grass-like shrubs at your feet. So MC Davis saw the light, the blinkers fell from his eyes. He went up next day, he gave these two ladies enough money so they could continue their program for two years and then said, please do me a favor. And they thought, uh oh, what's coming now? And he said, I want you to give me a list of the 100 most important environmental books. I'm way behind. He spent the next year reading them. He decided it was his duty to regrow as much longleaf pine forest as he could. He started buying up played out peanut farms and uh, other scruffy land, 51,000 acres, and then started spending a million dollars a year half of it on planting new longleaf pine and half of it as clearing up 
the landscape. When I caught up with him, um, he still looked a little scruffy, I thought. He said, well, we're in year 13 of a 300 year program. Come back in 200 years. Uh, MC unfortunately has passed on, but he's endowed the Nogosi plantation as it's called uh, with enough money to keep it going for the 300 year cycle. And of course, Florida black bears have returned to this landscape. So you got the combination of thinking on the scale of NOS and thinking locally, but connected on the part of uh, MC. And he's up in the Northwest corner, just east of one of those dark green, the dark green uh, blob on the Northwest panhandle of Florida's Eglin Air Force Base, which is huge and which actually has a lot of longleaf pine and they're now protecting as much of it as they can. So he's extending that and trying to bring it into the next area. Wonderful things are going on. That's part of the exciting news and why this book is such a hopeful book. Well, and, and so wonderful things are going on everywhere, including places like Florida, where the politics have become so divisive, but nonetheless, the environment is still something we can come together around, which is great. Sarah. Yeah, um, that's great. Well, I'm going to pivot a little bit. You, you know, both of our organizations are really focused on conducting primary research and exploring, you know, kind of cutting edge science related to a lot of the topics that you've written about. Um, but you also write really eloquently about the role of advocacy and the importance of storytelling in moving the needle in terms of the kinds of protection required to achieve the half earth goal and in terms of creating the public sector investment that is needed. Um, can you talk a little bit more about sort of the opportunities that you see for um, government and for advocates in achieving the goals of this work? Well, I, I th think what we really need and I see them coming into being are sort of grand coalitions of uh, public groups and private citizens, uh, some of them in organizations like yours, but some of them just uh, um, people living in, in their, their lives. Um, there's a second Appalachian-like uh, coalition on, that parallels the Appalachians and the Rockies, um, a Canadian environmental activist named Harvey Locke in the 90s had his vision of seeing the Rockies as a single place. And he created something called Yellowstone to Yukon up to the top of, of uh, Canada. It's now been extended also south into Mexico. And they've managed to protect something like 18% of that uh, enormous territory in the last 20 years, 25 years. Uh, simply by working with anyone who's willing to work with them. It's groups of farmers, it's group of ranchers, it's groups of citizens in cities, it's groups of foresters, uh, anyone who can catch hold of this idea that, that together something can happen and without the together nothing uh, can happen because we, these places need to stay connected or be reconnected if they have been severed. So uh, you, Sarah, for instance, your, your group is, reaches out to people, uh, both in terms of by building trails uh, through the natural areas uh, and, and advertising that and, and sort of giving people the high sign saying, come on in, you know, the forest is fine. Uh, and, and, Cary Institute, I know, has trails of its own. Uh, uh, so Millbrook is, begins to be seen as a destination. Uh, a lot of it is, is making destinations out of this, these places for people. In addition to the people that want to work on them, you want the people to come and enjoy them. So it's, we're just getting started. Uh, fortunately, if, if we're taking 50 by 50 as a goal, we got almost 30 years uh, to perfect this. Uh, and we seem to be getting better at it all the time. Um, this map, is it, I'm amazed even as someone who loves green spaces that 
New York is 11%, almost 12% natural area and 28% parks. So it's just under three fifths of the city is built. That's pretty good ratio. And of course, if you look at streets like this down in the Wall Street area, you think, where are the trees? Um, I don't see anything that's other than a shade of gray. People who are urban naturalists are also talking about growing things along the walls, growing things on the roof, growing things on the sidewalks. It's about time we reclaimed uh, whatever space we can for more greenery so we can begin to extend the green into the three fifths as well as take place of those core areas like the, the forests and the marshlands that have been protected. Um, a lot of it's just sort of was there because no one bothered to think about building on it. And, and again, you guys came along just in time to think, no, this is an asset, this is a core asset. This is part of the genius of the place. Uh, we must protect them and we must manage them properly and bring people to them. Does that answer your question? <laughs> That's great. So I've run out of questions, Sarah. You get to last, ask the last one if you have another one. Um, sure. Well, there's that. I will chime in with a final question. And this is, I think, one of the things, and it's been fun seeing people in the chat, um, Tony, just talk about how much they enjoyed your book, but also in, are enjoying your style of speaking and storytelling. And I think one of the things that has always struck me about your writing and your presenting is how hopeful you are in the face of such a really critical and, you know, sort of perilous um, potential future for our planet. You close your book with the line, over the course of this book, I came to realize that for this glorious beleaguered planet, there's room, there is room enough and time enough. And wondering if you can maybe share with us something that has made you feel hopeful over the past few months and maybe share a little bit about how you continue to show up for this work with a sense of wonder and optimism. You know, gradually over the last years, we've begun to extend uh, recognition to the fact that other species have a lot going on that we never gave them credit for. We know that gorillas uh, have loving families, We've found out that octopuses have active brains. But this year, a man named Lars Chitka wrote a book called The Mind of the Bee. And this astonished me. Now, a bee has a brain the size of a poppy seed. And yet, his research has been able to show that bees have a rich inner world and, like humans, are able to think enjoy and suffer. Reviewing his book in The New Scientist, their former editor-in-chief said, we're having to reconfigure our awareness to make room for the fact that we live in a vast sea of sentience. All these other species have got so much going on that we never gave them credit for. The practical application of this is there is no such thing as empty land or a vacant lot. It may not have buildings on it, but it is teeming with life, teeming with awareness. And we are retuning our awareness to take advantage of that and come to terms with that. So that when we build on a place, okay, maybe we need to do things for ourselves, but we have to make sure that we're doing things for all the other species that are there as well if we're going to call it a success. Well, uh, you know, I there was a, a, a conference in Washington, the Smithsonian ran, uh, Nancy Knowlton helped organize on, on conservation optimism. And Tony, I think you get the award for conservation optimism 
uh, you know, I think those of us who have watched the world change over our lifetimes uh, and can still remain optimistic, um, it's really important uh, because I think when people get pessimistic, they give up. And that optimism That's is right. hugely important because, you know, whatever whatever success we have, we're going to have because we think we can do it. Optimism is oxygen. There you go. Um, so um, it, that, mean, that means that it's an exciting time to be alive. Yeah. Because there's so much we can do. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And we have a bunch of great questions in about 10 minutes to address them. So I'll, I'll grab one out of our list and then Sarah, you can grab one and we can play this game. Um, one of the things that, that I think I think about a lot because I work with a bunch of land trusts is the role of private land and how private land can help us get to 50 by 50. And I was wondering what your thoughts were on that. Private land is incredibly important because there's more of it than there is public land, <laughs> one thing. Uh, and uh, again, in terms of thinking bigger, uh, people at the Highstead Foundation uh, in Connecticut came up with the idea of the regional conservation partnerships a few years ago, which is land trust, individual land trusts banding together so they have more strength acting as a collective. Um, and now much of New England is crisscrossed with regional conservation partnerships, uh, thanks to Highstead and also to the Wildlands and Woodlands program that David Foster set up. Yeah. But there's one right in, between, sort of between Cary Institute and Natural Areas Conservancy called Hudson to Hugh Satonic, uh, which is all of the cities outside the metro, outside New York City that are within the metropolitan area and all of the suburbs. Uh, and they're about 10 years old now. And they are seriously contemplating taking as a goal 50% protecting 50% of that landscape um, by the year uh, 2060. I, everyone has a different date than you know, 20, but still 50% by 60 in the suburbs of New York would be astonishing. Which brings us to lawns, which was one of your poll questions. Um, wonderful work is being done in terms of reclaiming lawns or pieces of lawns <coughs> as natural areas. Uh, in a movement called Homegrown National Park. L lawns are amazingly one of the top uh, crops that we grow in this country. Corn, wheat, and lawn are the three most princ three principal crops we grow. And lawns are homogeneous or homogeneous areas with uh, very little diversity. However, they you, in part, they can be reclaimed uh, and native plants that pollinators like can be established in what are called pollinator pathways. And that movement is catching on like wildfire. Uh, and it's got its own subtle variations. Some insects can only go a few feet or they need another sup. Uh, others can go a hundred feet, others a thousand feet. So you need a whole combination of these things. Uh, and suddenly people find their backyards are got birds and got pollinators and got butterflies and have got bees that were never there before. Uh, some of their neighbors think ugly, other neighbors think exciting. Uh, and it's changing, it's changing the suburbs in an amazing way. Um. So a couple of people in the chat have asked about books that inspire you. People ask for your top 10, but I'm going to ask you if you can oh, just share yeah. your top three um, books kind of related to this topic that you have either drawn on for factual information or that have added to this flow of inspiration for you around this topic. Oh, gosh. I need notice of that kind of question because there's so many, but... Uh... If that one feels too challenging, I can ask you a different one. <laughs> no, no, I'll do my best. Uh, one, one book is called Planetary Health. Uh, I seem to have turned off my video by mistake. 
I'm still here. Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> uh, let me grab this book. So this is the kind of thing you can do on a virtual seminar that you can't do in, in real life. Uh, <laughs> read, read your personal library. <laughs> yeah, read your library. Stand up. Get, you know. Planetary Health, Protecting Nature to Protect Ourselves, um, edited by Samuel Myers and Howard Frumkin. It's a big, heavy book, but it's got so much in it. Uh, and this is an, an adjacent idea, which is that we have to think simultaneously about the health of humanity, the health of the natural world, and the health of the planet. Uh, and this is a way of, of factoring in things like pandemics uh, into our thinking. So you'll see it's hundreds of pages, beautiful color illustrations. Um, I wouldn't call it bedtime reading, but it is full of uh, amazing charts and facts and, and uh, really something encyclopedic as a reference point. Now, other books, well, of course, the writings of E.O. Wilson. Uh, one of his books is Biophilia, which posits the idea that we have a natural propensity to uh, be fond of other animals. And I must say it was partly Biophilia that got me started on this book, responding to the plight of the animals, the things we've been losing like the last male um, white rhino uh, who died a few years ago with his beloved keeper at his side, or Lonesome George, the last Pinta Island Galapagos giant tortoise who died a few years ago at the age of 101. Uh, Solitario Jorge in Spanish, Lonesome George. Uh, I just couldn't help feeling the pain. <laughs> Uh, of this loss. Can you imagine a world without elephants or tigers uh, or without uh, South Brooklyn beaches like the one behind Sarah or the landscape of the Cary Institute? Uh, uh, in a word, no. No. <laughs> uh, but you know, I think uh, Tony, the, the link between health and environment, if you look at somebody like David Quammen, right? David started as a nature writer and increasingly he has written about pandemics and the interrelationship between human activities and spillover, his book Spillover and the latest one, I think it's called Breathless, which describes my voice today. Um, but, but I think people need to understand that, you know, biodiversity, is good for us. It's not just good for the planet, it is good for us. And humans tend to do better when they think that something is good for them. That's not the only reason. No, it's true. Primer. There are so-called practical reasons for saving uh, the other species. As, so I, I said, as I said before, you know, we wouldn't have oxygen to breathe if it wasn't for them. And yeah. We wouldn't have clean water to drink. Yeah, It's not just something well, I'm going to riff. I'm going to riff on clean water. You talked about the Hudson, Hudson to Housatonic, and somebody asked a question about whether we could do a Yellowstone to Yukon that went from the Adirondacks to New York City or some New York State kind of scale of thing. Yes, let's yes. get started. Absolutely, okay. <laughs> let's start thinking about it. And I want that both Josh and Sarah involved. Okay, and and we'll talk to our friends at uh, up in the Adirondacks and see what we can do. Um, Sarah, do you have any favorite questions you want to pick out or? Yeah, I, I am just scrolling here. I think there's just taking a quick look. Um, I, love, I love one of David Quammen's titles, by the way, the song of the dodo. Indeed. Another Island biogeography book. Yes. Um, yeah, I think one one question is, and I think it always kind of a nice question at this point in a conversation is, what do you recommend to an individual interested in getting involved in this work? If you could offer a couple of suggestions for somebody who wants to 
engage and contribute their time and energy towards the goal of 30 by 30? Well, that's a very good question. And almost anything is a way in. Um, depends what scale you're interested in. I mean, if, if you're the kind of person who likes to give money to good causes, uh, there's a wonderful new group called One Earth, which has a website where they list projects that they've vetted all over the planet. Uh, and if you do donate to them, 100% of your donation goes to these groups and not, nothing gets siphoned off uh, for carrying charges. Um, as I said, Wilson set up the Half Earth Institute. There's the Nature Needs Half. Then there are uh, large scale projects like Yellowstone to Yukon uh, or the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, which is trying to bring the Appalachian realm into being. And then there are things closer to home. Uh, could be if you live in the city, the natural areas of our city, New York. If you live beyond the city, could be kind of work that the Cary Institute's doing or anything in between. If you have a lawn, it doesn't have to be just a lawn. Uh, if, if there's no tree on your block, you could start getting a trees planted. Um, among bird watchers, there's this phrase spark bird, uh, meaning the bird that at some point in their life grabbed them and said, this is amazing. And thereafter, their life was changed. But it doesn't have to be a bird. It can be absolutely anything. Uh, could be just noticing that there are tiny little plants that grow in the cracks of the sidewalk, so-called ruderal vegetation, meaning rubble vegetation, uh, which was sort of discovered and given recognition in post-war Berlin, among the ruins of Berlin. Um, but we don't have ruins to build on, we have actual places to build on and make better. Uh, so it's hard to think of a way not to get started if, if that's what's, if it's grabbing you, the urge is grabbing you. I saw a video of a bald eagle swooping down gracefully, just touching the water and coming up with a huge salmon and its talons. So, Sometimes the talents just reach into you and say, it's time for you to want to get involved. Uh, and then there are a myriad ways to do it because it's going to take all of us, like it or not, uh, this is the carrying charge of being here in this amazing biosphere at this point in time. Uh, I don't think I have anything else to say, but thank you, Tony. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you to our staff. And most importantly, thank you to everyone for coming to this. Uh, somebody said, you know, um, what can I do if, uh, to, to help get the word out? More people should be here. We will send you all a link to the recording. Please post it on your social media, send it to your friends and family. Tony's got something he wants to I will say. You could also read my book and they're offering a wonderful link to a discounted price on the book. And I repeat my offer. Anyone who wants an inscribed personalized book plate, just email me and I'll be delighted to mail it to you. And we will put all of that information in the email we send you. But we uh, really appreciate your coming tonight. Thank you so much. And uh, it's Thursday, so I'll say a little early. Have a wonderful weekend. Thanks so much. Okay, bye. Bye. Thank you all.